particularly honored to introduce Mary this evening. I had the distinct pleasure last year while in seminary. Uh, Mary came and spoke with one of, to one of my classes about poetry and faith that Christian Lyman led. And it was really a very powerful um, experience to hear her talk about um, her life and her faith and her writing. So I am thrilled that she is here this evening. Mary Carr, we know as an award-winning poet, best-selling memoirs, and also a professor of literature at Syracuse University. She's the author of the critically acclaimed memoirs, The Liars Club, Cherry, and Lit. And her latest book, The Art of Memoir, is truly a master class in this burgeoning uh, literary genre. She recently made her debut as a songwriter with the release of Kin, Songs by Mary Carr and Rodney Crowell, and is currently adapting her books um, for a Showtime series based on the story of her life. So please join me in welcoming her. I don't want to see God on the subway when it's crowded. I want everything. 
everybody to get off the subway so I'm more, more comfortable. Um, but I recall that even in a concentration camp or the most dire circumstances. Uh, I'm also a poet, which means that I am by nature a glum buddy. I have spent my life memorizing the bad news. Um, mine is not a grateful nature. And you, you could say much of the unhappiness or depression I've had in my life comes from a kind of hypersensitivity. Maybe you know somebody like this, maybe you have a kid like this, God forbid, maybe you are like this. But there, there are some of us, I think, who just have more frames per second than other people. And, and maybe we're getting a lot more information than other people are getting. But we are, it makes us feel overwhelmed and confused by things that other people seem to like high school, that other people seem to sashay through. They feel more like, you know, Kafka-esque torture chambers. So, um, most of my life, I didn't have what you would call a panic disorder. I, I never had that. I have friends who have that, but they get on airplanes and they hyperventilate and they're truly terrified. But I had a kind of low-level, simmering anxiety, even as a child. Uh, and of course, every spiritual practice tells us the same thing, that love is the solution to this. Love is the answer. What they don't talk about is how miserable other human beings are, how they refuse to cooperate with us. And for me, the, the opposite of love isn't hate. It, it, it isn't even indifference. It's fear. It's being afraid. And being afraid, as we see in this political environment, can reduce us to a state of, me anyway, let me speak for myself, of a dog growling over a mom, afraid someone's going to take it away from me. Um, some people say that this anxiety or fear that I have came not from a hypersensitive nature, but from my so-called family life. Um, my mother was married seven times. Both my parents drank, and because it was Texas, they were well armed. Um, twice in my childhood, I ran about of pedophiles. And, but at the same time, I like to say that a dysfunctional family is any family with more than one person. I was born with enormous privilege. I was born white in a culture that privileges that. I was born in the richest country in the world. I'm naturally skinny. My teeth came in mostly straight. I had a triple digit IQ. All of these things. Uh, you know, I was not born in Rwanda. I was not born in Auschwitz. Um, people have had way worse times. There were bullet holes in my house. I guess that's the simplest way to say it. When, when I was having my mother's kitchen retiled, at one point the tile dude cries off the tile and holds the tile up and says to my little fluffy here, 80 year old mother, Oh, Miss Carr, this looks like a bullet hole. And she says, and my sister says, Isn't that where you shot it, Daddy? <laughs> and my mother, who's extremely unconventional, as you might guess, says, No, that's where I shot it, Larry. <laughs> oh, there's where I shot it, Jim. <laughs> um, so most of my fear as a child was actually not around my death, but around my parents. I was afraid that something was going to happen to them. I saw them driving cars when I knew they weren't capable of it. I just saw that they didn't quite have it all together. So I remember as a child a kind of just kind of vivid memory for me was standing in the back of the garage just willing my mother's car to come up with her alive and just praying. I didn't really pray because I didn't believe in God, but just as though I could magnetic, magnetically suck it off those dark and scary roads uh, safely back home. There was a big jackpot night I write about in the Myers Club. There was a fire, there was a butcher knife. And the cops came, the fire department came, and the guys from the loony bin came to take my mother, capital A, 
away. And after this, my behavior really degraded. I was never a particularly well-behaved child, but I became very um, explosive. I, um, I would jump like a buzzsaw into anybody popping off, any of the kids in my neighborhood popping off about my mother. And looking back, people think the things that other kids said to me were hard, but really they were just trying to toughen me up to the facts of my life. So I heard my mother was crazy as a mud bug and nutty as a fruit cake, and she didn't have both the words in the water, and she had been slam dunked in the mental Marriott, the Ha Ha Hotel. I was the littlest kid in my neighborhood, and my, my father was a kind of barroom storyteller uh, from an even more backwards place than I grew up. He used to tell me to bite the people bigger than me who were jumping on me. He would say, no, he did. He said, look, you've got to leave a mark. You can't, you can't let a be go like this, or they're going to keep coming. And his, his phrase for this was, lay the ivory drawer. <laughs> And I, I always say that I didn't that I didn't really pray, but there is some evidence, there is recorded evidence of my praying uh, when I was 10 years old. I don't remember praying. But in 1965, I wrote, I, I watched the song of Bernadette. I mean, anybody ever see that? No, the yeah. Lord's, you know, when the water comes from the rock. I never get the rock comes from the rock here, but I can't get these other things I'll tell you about. But the, I watched the song of Bernadette, and I drew in my little journal, Jesus crucified. I, I should have known that the fact that I was going right for crucifixion, I'd wind up Catholic. That should have been, <laughs> should have been my clue. But, um, and it wasn't, I wasn't a very good drawer of, of people, and so it was kind of gingerbread Jesus with, you know, I could just do the outline. And, um, and I wrote this long sort of prayer about wanting to be good, how I wished I were good. And at the end of this, at the end of this, I wrote this kind of pathetic little sentence that I, I talked about, and there's actually a facsimile of it in my in my parish review interview, so you know I didn't make this up. It says, I am not very successful as a little girl. When I grow up, I will probably be a mess. Which was what the ladies in my neighborhood would say to me. They'd say, you're a mess. You're a mess. Mary Carr is a mess. And um, my daddy paid me to cuss because he thought it was funny. So I, I cussed when I had a fight with the kids in my neighborhood. I would cuss them, or I would, you know, I'd cuss most anybody. And, and I remember a particular lady saying, Mary Carr, there are snakes and lizards coming out of your mouth. And I said, I don't give a steaming, uh, I won't say what I said, but you get the idea. And then after this, I wrote this very strange, so I have this little moment of prayer. And then I write about, really about being wounded. I write about feeling inadequate to the task of being a human being. And I talk about feeling wounded, that I'm a mess, that I'm not up to what I'm supposed to be up to. And then I wrote kind of the most unlikely sentence for me to write. I was 10 years old, and I said, when I grow up, I will write one half poetry and one half autobiography. Very strange sentence for me to have written. I mean, it's not God guiding Paul's hand. You know, it's not the water coming it's from the rock. It's not the bullet hole going in the front of the helmet and coming out of the back and I'm fine. But what are the odds? I lived in this town for the nearest bookstore was maybe 90 miles away in Houston, almost 100 miles away. I, I think I read Helen Keller. Maybe I, my mother was in the, involved a little in the civil rights movement. She was in Selma, marched with Dr. King. I think we had a copy of Richard Wright's Black Boy, which had been a big, big bestseller in the late 40s. But there weren't any autobiographies in my house. And I don't know where 
where would I get this sentence from? And when I look at that, now the cynic in me says today, you know, what Zola always said, the road to Lourdes is littered with crutches. There's never a good letter. So the cynic in me wants to say, well, I had this idea that maybe I wanted to do this. And it just came to me. What a strange thing, I think, to have written. And it came not out of deep belief, not out of a faith that I had crammed down my throat, not out of having been dragged, kicking and screaming, or going willingly to church. It came to me. I watched a television show, and I had a sense of that woundedness, of that being hurt. And I admitted it to whatever vague sense of, of God I had at that moment, which really, I had been told was ridiculous, was tacitly ridiculous. I am a mess. It's hard to think of the crucifixion as anything but a mess. What a mess. So let's flash forward 25 years. I have developed a little drinking habit. I have convinced somebody to marry me. He's a big uh, Harvard hockey player um, who looked like something you put in a raffle. <laughs> say that, that uh, the average well-bred American wasp can ignore reality better than most heroin addicts. <laughs> Which was a good thing for my husband because he was going to have to ignore a lot uh, being married to me. I won't bore you with a drunk log. I went here and got drunk. I went there and got drunk. I tried drinking this way. I tried, tried quitting that way. It's just, it's a lot of repetition. But at the end of my drinking, and I don't know when I crossed that line, I wasn't always an alcoholic, but at some point, I just didn't have control of it anymore. I just couldn't, I couldn't quit drinking, and it was, I was getting in trouble. I mean, to me, a definition of an alcoholic is that you have consequences unacceptable to you, and you continue to drink, that are directly. So maybe going to jail, sleeping with people you don't want to sleep with, getting a DUI, maybe losing a job, maybe that's not unacceptable to you. But I was having consequences. A terror, rage, joy, to anxiety, irritation, and excitement. So I could get excited about something, but I was never really joyful about anything. And mostly the things I was excited about were not uh, very good for me. And I, I remember, I will tell you a couple of stories from the end of my drinking, because they're about that loveliness, I think, for God. To me, when I think of those moments, they're about that longing. I lived, was living in Belmont, Massachusetts. I had a baby, and I would sit on the back porch about as big as this third, third of the platform is right here. It was a little landing really off the back door that went down to the garage. And I would, I would sit there with the baby monitor in my lap, like the bad mom in the after school special, <laughs> and smoke marbles. Remember when we could smoke? <laughs> so great. Um, and drink Jack Daniels. And generate reasons why this was this was the highlight of my day. And I've often asked myself, well, and everything I did all day, taking care of the child, sleeping with my husband, teaching at the various schools I was privileged to get to teach in, none of publishing a little bit, starting to publish, none of that mattered. It was all an obstacle to get to this place. What was so great? about this little piece of what Nabokov would call unreal estate, right? This little spot right here. Because however I thought things were in the world, that's how they were. I had control over this area. This was my kingdom. And however, whatever I believed in that spot at that time, it was true. For instance, I remember thinking, really almost on a nightly basis, this is the last night 
I'm going to drink here. So last night, I'm going to finish this bottle of wine, and, and that's, that's it. I'm going to get up in the morning, and I would tell myself this about midnight or 1 o'clock in the morning, smoking and drinking, I would say, I'm going to get up at 5 o'clock in the morning and run three miles. <laughs> I would wake up feeling like I have ax in my forehead and think, oh, I need a drink. Um, and when I woke up in the morning, my mind was awake before me. It never had anything to say. It's like the vulture on the bedpost. It was that bruises bone cancer. Uh, you're not going to win this prize. You're not going to get this job. So I started. I started trying to quit drinking, and and um, you go. You go to these meetings in these church basements. Oh, you just can't imagine. I didn't walk in and say, "Oh, look at all these nice, friendly people who are going to talk to me and help me to quit drinking." I just thought, "This is the worst. This is just the lowest." Um, they're going to have me selling incense at the airport <laughs> in, in, in another two days. I'm so close. Uh, and boy, were they happy. They were Protestant happy. <laughs> they were like, you know, we're happy to be thankful, to be grateful, to be here, and we have drunk the Kool-Aid, and I just thought, I've got to get away from these people. There was one woman I really liked. Her name is Joan. She was a Harvard social theorist, a very impressive intellectual resume. And she was able to not, she had been drinking like me, and she'd been like five or six years since she hadn't had a drink. She was finishing, she was teaching at Harvard. She was a super smart woman, very interesting, very independent. And I would call her. She said, you have to call me today. So I would call her and I would tell her what I was afraid of. And she would ask me a very good question. You might find this a useful question. I would tell her something I was afraid of, and she would say, what is your source of information? <laughs> Invariably, it was that I had thought it up <laughs> at home. My mother-in-law thinks that the good book, she doesn't approve it, and it, it doesn't matter. What is your source of information? So I began to get this idea that I wasn't seeing the world clearly. I mean, the whole point of being an agnostic or an atheist is not to be fooled. The American religion right now is doubt. Whoever believes the least wins. Because you'll never be made for the world. You never want to be made for the world. You never want to be a chump. You don't want to fall for so much of hooey and, and be found out that uh, you know cholesterol is really good for you. Um, but I did notice something in these meetings. I noticed that people who talked about some higher power who said, you know, I meditate every day, or I pray every day, or I volunteer at a woman's sh shelter, or I volunteer at a soup kitchen. These were the people who didn't seem to want to kill everybody on the subway. <laughs> they had something that looked appealing or attractive to me. So I sort of, I come in and I drink, I go out, I come in and I go out. Finally, I get about 90 days sober. It's a huge accomplishment. 90 days without a drink, I can't tell you. It's never been a longer period of time in my life. And at that point, I started to be willing to try to pray. You know, I, I want to explain that. I had no concept of God whatsoever. Nothing. I had nothing. And Joe LeBone said to me, I want you to get on your knees, morning and night, and pray. And I said, now what kind of God wants me to grovel to, in order to, to put it, I'm going to like make him feel like a big deal, like he's supposed to have created the universe, and I'm going to like, I'm going to become abject in this. And she's like, you don't do it for God. And I'm like, well, then why do it at all? Because I don't want to get on my knees. She said, you do it to show yourself how little you have control of it. Because you're an idiot. <laughs> because you have to put yourself in a physically humble position, or else you won't know that everything you're thinking of isn't in fact true. <coughs> so she had this kind of way of talking to me in these psychological terms that made it feasible. So she's, and she said another sentence to me that what if the solution to all your problems is a spiritual solution? You've been in therapy since you were 19 years old. You've, you've 
you know all these smart philosophers and you've read all these books and and, and you're a mess. And this is something you haven't tried. What if you just pray? She said, she said it this way. Pray on your knees every day for 30 days and see if your life gets better. Do it like a scientific experiment. Oh, please, 30 days. She did another thing, too. Because I was so ungrateful, she made me take a gratitude list every night for every letter of the alphabet. Like for A, I had a good apple today. B, I didn't beat my son to death. You know, C, I mean, it was bad. So I started praying, and so after what she had said, how's it going? I said, it's ridiculous. I get on my knees, you know, I say, you know, help me stay up. Then I realized, and then there was this gratitude. She said, well, you know, tell me some of the things I I realized I was saying things I thought I was supposed to be grateful for or else the God I didn't believe in was going to take it away from me. <laughs> so, I just started noticing this. And Joe said, well, what are you praying for? I'm like, I'm praying to stand it. I'm just praying not to shoot myself. I didn't have to go to the house. It, that's not an accident. She said, well, why don't you pray for something you want? I said, Joe, I'm teaching six sections of composition at three universities. I made $9,000 this year. I need to make more money. I had a kid. She said, well, why don't you pray for money? And I was like, oh, really? It's like Jimmy Swagger. I'm going to put my hand on the television and send him a dollar. <laughs> and she's like, well, what does it hurt? What does it cost you? Okay. So I start praying for money. You're not going to believe this either. Three weeks later, a man calls me from New York City and says, I actually thought it was my friend George playing a trick on me, saying that I, they were giving me $35,000 for a writing prize I had never applied for that somebody had nominated me for. And so Joan says, well, of course, now you believe. And she's like, and I'm like, no, because I had to be nominated before I was praying. <laughs> nominated before I was pregnant. So when I was drinking Jack Daniels every day, why don't I just say that drinking Jack Daniels made them nominate me? So I was a sort of hard case. Um, but something started to happen to me south of my neck is the only way I can explain it. I would get a sense of quiet just down here. And my head, which it, you guys have figured out was like a rabbit chihuahua, <laughs> yammering constantly, never happy, um, would just get quiet. So I would be running to a class, and my son would be in the car, and we'd have a flat tire, and it was raining, and I would just think, eh, you yeah, know, we can walk. It'll be fine. So the job I now hold at Syracuse University, which was a tenure track job, and those of you who have worked in the academic ghetto know that that's like, oh, the angels say the clouds are, um, was a tenure track job. I turned it down three times because I was praying about it, and I was afraid to leave all the women I had made friends with. I was afraid I was going to get drunk. I'm just starting to feel better. Well, when I got to the university, they find the guy who hired me said, you know, the last offer we made you, which you accepted that, we were going to call the next candidate. They thought I was negotiating. And, and it, so I never got, unfortunately, this holds to this day when I pray, I never get a long-range plan, never get a five-year plan, never get the number on the line. No one's ever offered me $35,000 again. <laughs> Never gotten any free money again. That was the one time, I guess, gumball prayer that they just went through because uh, I was such a hard case. But I started to have a sense that there was a force for good. Actually, what I started to think was there is the real me and the fake me. There is the scared me and the sober me. There's the same me and the crazy me. I work with young women now trying to get sober, and I had one call me a couple of weeks ago and say, I slapped my daughter. I said, well, okay. She's 
like, no, she's crying. She's like, you know, she and I are going crazy. I said, okay. She said, no, I really think I need to be like put in an institution. I said, look, you don't need me to tell you not to slap your daughter. You know it's the wrong thing to do. You don't know. I don't need to tell you that. You know? Well, I apologized to her. I said, look, she's five years old. She won't remember in 20 minutes. But obviously, this means something about you. What are you doing for yourself? And she said, but no, you understand, I'm really going crazy, I'm really going crazy. I'm like, okay, okay, who's noticing that you're going crazy? I started to develop this noticer self, this self kind of, again, south of my neck, that would say very strange things to me, like, um, you need a sandwich. <laughs> I mean, you could just say very simple things, you know, like, like uh, you're going to miss that train. No need to run. You're going to miss that train. It's more important to take time with this and clean it up than to be in a hurry and get to the next event. For anybody we knew who had any kind of spiritual practice, we would go with them to their church or temple or zendo. We went to the Episcopal Church, the Baptist Church. We went to a Jewish midrash. We went to a conservative temple. We went to a reformed temple. And I don't know, I now think it was the priest who, at that church, who was not a firebrand, renegade priest. Little Irish, not the brightest bulb on the tree. <laughs> now, in that church, Jerry Berrigan actually attended that church. And there were some Catholic firebrands with social justice ministries doing great things for Salvador and said, for the poor, and there's one the prison ministry to volunteer for them. all these things that we're doing. Something about this priest, who ultimately I would spend a lot of time with, he not only baptized me, but the whole time he was dying, I saw him almost every day. Um, I didn't decide to become Catholic. And so let me also say that the grandeur of the Mass, the smells and the bells and the gold stuff and Sweeney and all that meant nothing to me. It wasn't the big stuff. It was the simple faith of the people. It was coming in and seeing a woman who I knew was going to go clean somebody's house on the front row on her knees. Or on the back row, usually on the back row on her knees. It was during the intentions when someone would say, you know, prayer intentions. This is, please pray for my mother who's going to have surgery. Pray a thing, prayer of thanksgiving for my daughter who just gave birth in a safe. Something about it. But I wasn't intending to be baptized. But my son started taking instruction. My son wanted to take communion, even though his father was Episcopal. We agreed he wanted to do it. And I thought, you know, I should take instruction to know what these crazy medieval people are teaching. I was also not Catholic, not raised Catholic. Um, he had a brief run at it as a boy, but he converted after Vietnam. Why don't you just go talk to Tony? And we'll get, try to get you baptized. He said, well, I, I don't know that I'm going to be baptized. I just want to know what you're, what you're teaching my son. And at a certain point, I, it was right before Easter, he said to me, um, let me ask you something. He said, you keep going to Mass, even when you're out of town. I had been to Rome, and I had gone to a church in Rome. I had been to the UK, traveling for a book, and I found myself going to Mass, Catholic Mass. And he said, why are you doing that? I'm like, well, you know, my son's going to be baptized, so she knows what's going on. <laughs> he said, you believe in open, open communion. He said, yes, I do. I believe that I would pass by my house and not give it away. So why don't you take communion in those churches? He said, I would never do that. He said, why not? He said, well, it would be just so offensive to me for people. This is a 2,000-year-old tradition that people have died for and committed their lives to and raised their babies in and signed pieces of paper that they're into. <laughs> you know, I mean, it would be so disrespectful. And he said, 
So that is sacred to you. And this is the kind of ninja theological stuff that was happening. So this, this little parish priest, when I said I was doing the Ignatian exercises, he said, oh, I can never do all that reading. <laughs> so hard, all that reading, just so hard. Um, or when I was reading Hans Kong, he said, oh, I could never read a book. It's just too hard. And I remember saying to him before I was baptized, you know, I think women should be priests. And I, I was so angry, I kept a big earful about it. And he said, I'll bet the Holy Father prays about that a lot. And I was like, what happened? <laughs> you know, like, I was coming right at him, and he just moved, and I was spinning through the air. And, uh, and I said, and another thing, and another thing. I don't think the Pope is the ultimate religious authority. He said, maybe you will someday. And I think of Joe, who uh, I spent all this time with before he went to live with Jesus, thinking about what's going on with your political institutions or your civil institutions. I'm still in America, and I still participate in the process, and I still want to change. Uh, I'm still hoping my church will change, really, to become more like your church, honestly, quite honestly. So, this is a poem called Disgrace Land. It's not about us. <laughs> Before my first communion at 40, I clung to doubt as Satan spider like stalked the orb of dark surrounding Eden for a wormhole into paradise. God had first formed me in a womb, small as a bite of burger. Once my lungs were done, he sailed a soul like a lit arrow to inflame me. Maybe that piercing is what made me howl at birth, or the masked creatures whose scalpel cut a lightning bolt to free me. Eventually, I lurched out, kiss the wrong bounds, get stewed, and sulk around. Christ always stood to one side with a glass of water. I swatted the sap away. But my thirst got great enough to ask. A stream welled up inside me, and some wave buoyed me forward. I found myself upright in the instant with a garden inside my own ribs to flourish. There the arbor leaves, the vines push out plump grapes. You are loved, someone said. Take that and eat it. Thank you. <laughs>